So warm greetings to everyone and welcome to this Prevention Collaborative webinar. And for those who may not be familiar with the Prevention Collaborative, the Prevention Collaborative is a global organization that aims to strengthen programs to prevent violence against women and their children by connecting research evidence, practice-based knowledge and programs. We partner with organizations to support their prevention work through a mentorship model rooted in relationship building, partnership, and mutual learning. We engage with these partners to understand, document, and share their experiences with the broader field, and we seek to partner and learn from the Global South experience. So, to introduce myself, I'm Rita Niratunga. I work with the Prevention Collaborative as a Senior Associate Capacity Development. I'm based in Kigali, Rwanda. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. The topic, as you can see on those slides, we're going to be talking about women's economic empowerment and intimate partner violence and try to untangle the intersections. Um, our speaker today, we honored to be with uh, Lori Heise. Lori Heise is a social epidemiologist with over 30 years experience working in the field of gender, violence and HIV. She is an internationally recognized expert on the causes and prevention of intimate partner violence. She played an important role in getting violence against women onto the global public health agenda and developed the ecological model that many of you may know. And that uh, model helps to understand VOW, which has influenced many prevention studies and programs across the world. Laurie has previously been chief executive of STRIVE. You may know that. And she's currently the technical director of Prevention Collaborative and a professor of social epidemiology at Hope, John Hopkins University based in the United States. So thank you so much, Laurie, for being with us today. Thanks. Before I hand over to you, Laurie, to give your presentation, I'd like to invite my colleague, Juliana, to take a few minutes to introduce herself and give us some housekeeping notes. Over to you, Juliana. Thank you, Rita. Uh, this is Juliana Morales. I am an associate of Knowledge into Action with the Prevention Collaborative, and I'm just jumping in to give you a few housekeeping notes. First, uh, this webinar is being recorded, and we will be sharing both the recording and key takeaways via email. We'll also have time for a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, and you'll be able to engage in a couple of ways. The first is by typing your questions directly in the chat box at any point during the webinar, and you can find the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And here we just highlighted it in a red box for easy reference. Um, during the actual Q&A session, you also have the option of raising your hands. And we've, we've highlighted that in a blue box here. Once you raise your hand, we'll go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. Uh, we do recommend that if you are asking questions or sharing comments that you change the to section to all panelists and attendees. And this just means that everyone uh, we'll be able to see your comment or questions. So we hope to see, see everyone engage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliana. And just to uh, remind people that uh, apart from the questions, if you have any question of clarity from Lori's presentation, you may be able to put it in the chat box and Lori will make sure she goes back to the point before we go into the question and answers. So over to you, Lori. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Rita and Juliana. Um, I am going today to try to do a, a very difficult thing, and I'm hoping that perhaps even some of those of you in the audience can, can help us along the way, because the issue of women's economic empowerment and violence against women is one that's quite complex. Uh, our understanding of it is still evolving, um, and we're trying to sort of make sense of the emerging evidence base. So I encourage those who may come with your own experience to feel free to also offer up uh, observations and uh, to people's questions. Um, what I was hoping to do today is start by just reviewing a little bit about women's economic uh, empowerment and the kinds of programs that exist out uh, in the world and are being implemented. 
I want to review some of the evidence um, from research uh, about the relationship between women's economic empowerment and especially intimate partner violence. Um, while I think there's many, many kinds, obviously, of, of violence against women and, and their children, um, our evidence base right now is really quite restricted to how um, economic empowerment intersects with women's risk within the home. So we're gonna be focusing on that today. Um, I wanna describe a few promising programs to give people a sense of the type of program, programming that's going on in different parts of the world, and then offer just some um, brief insights for implementation and things that we could take on board, uh, given what we know now uh, in terms of this uh, relationship. So just to start out, there's really, uh, what I have found is that this term, women's economic empowerment, is used by different actors in very different ways. Um, sometimes it is, something, it, it is used to refer to just getting more women in higher positions in certain industries. But in the development context, and in the context that many of us are working either in long-term international development or humanitarian settings, there are a couple of core concepts that you see over and over again in different definitions. So here I offer just two for our reflection. One is the, the definition put forward by UN Women. Um, and, and they talk about women's economic empowerment in terms of women's ability to participate equally with men in existing markets, um, to have access and control over productive resources, to have access to productive and decent work. So the quality of work, um, the formality, informality, and then increased voice agency and meaningful participation in decision-making. Um, recognizing that that challenge exists all the way from the household up to major uh, economic institutions. On the right, uh, you see a little icon um, diagram of, of the way that the Gates Foundation has formulated their work in women's economic empowerment, and it actually is quite similar. So they speak in terms of women's access to income and assets, the control of and benefit from economic gains, and the power to make decisions. So while there are variations, this notion of power, access, and control are something that you see throughout our field. Now, if we think about how does that actually get operationalized in programming and what are people actually doing in trying to, uh, to facilitate uh, economic empowerment and equity, is we see a number of different kinds of programs around the world. There's a kind of grouping that I, I put into the access and control over cash and assets. And, and these are programs which at their most basic are sort of group-based village savings and loan associations or savings um, schemes where women will come together in groups, uh, try to pool their small resources, and then once there's enough capital in the group, potentially lend it out to other members of the group. Um, there's cash transfers, where there's actual direct giving of cash as part of social protection programs or as part of an international development program. There's a whole set of, of work that's going on around access to financial services. So the fact that women don't have access to bank accounts or mobile savings. So how can we, how can we assist women to, to interact more effectively with the existing financial institutions? And then there's asset transfers. So there's a lot of programs that are focused less on cash and giving things like livestock, pigs or cattle um, that create a, a longer term foundation, both for women uh, in terms of, of income and asset accumulation. Um, then there's the second bucket, which is uh, increased access to decent and paid work. And, and here you see, not surprisingly, things like job training. There's a lot of programs that work on sort of soft skills and overcoming sort of mindset challenges or, or, or preparing for the work environment. And then the final grouping is what I classify under sort of 
entrepreneurial skills. And so this can be access to credit for small businesses or seed grants, uh, business development skills and sort of financial literacy, and then also trying to link women uh, to existing markets um, through better understanding of what the op market opportunities are in their settings. Um, so with that background, um, if we think about the potential benefits of those programs for women, I think that there's a, they, they operate both at an individual and family level as well as at a community level. So if you think about at an individual level, obviously if women have greater access and control over resources or are uh, new, uh, newly employed, for example, they're gonna have increased income, they might have increased financial or business skills, this could translate and has in studies to better health and well being, as well as some of these soft things like greater confidence and self esteem. Um, there's also the question is, you know, does the empowering influence of having more control over resources actually in uh, of itself help shift attitudes, norms and the roles that women would play in the household. At a community level, um, what we've seen in studies is that these types of programs can actually help increase women's visibility and their status in the community. And in the qualitative data, you see a lot as women talking about how having these new skills and, and being seen as an actor or a leader in the community is, is highly valuable to them. Um, it also means that frequently because they learn skills around how to speak up in groups, how to um, manage money or manage groups or organizations, that those skills can transfer into other areas of community influence and decision making. Um, and also because many of these programs tend to be group based or, or networked in some way, it, it, there is the thought that it can increase women's social capital and, and, and just their, their network and ability to access support and, and information. So if with that background, the, what I wanted to take on board today is, is, is really looking at this question of what is the link uh, between women's economic empowerment and uh, domestic violence or intimate partner violence. Uh, again, this is the most common form of violence that women experience globally, and it's also the one um, that we have the most information on. So uh, when I'm speaking, I'm mostly speaking about this particular relationship. So I think the key take home message <laughs> for the whole talk and for where we are is that there is oftentimes an association between key economic variables and studies. So whether that's um, income, assets, economic empowerment, decision making, there are relationships between those things and um, levels of IPV, but there is no consistent relationship across setting. And that's different than what we see, for example, um, with something like the relationship between heavy and binge drinking and the risk of domestic violence across setting. That's a relationship that you see over and over and over again. It's highly consistent across setting. Um, and you don't see that in one area, out, uh, binge drinking increases violence and in another area, it decreases violence. However, our evidence base with the economic is more complicated. Um, and I think what we want to do today is try to start to unpick why is it so complicated and why do we see this variation? So the first thing I want to do is just look at what we know um, outside of programming. So if we're just looking at data that exist on at a population level or at a community level about whether um, the circumstances of women's lives uh, and their economic status and how that influences their individual risk of HIV, sorry, of IPV. Um, we'll start with that and then we'll overlay and start to think about, well, if we intervene and we actually do programming, what does the evidence uh, tell us from that information? Um, 
I think one of the things that I want to just note is that I'm going to be talking mostly at the beginning about association. So these are studies where you take a snapshot in time and you look at, you know, do women who have, who are employed have a higher risk of, of experiencing domestic violence or a lower risk? Um, that doesn't necessarily confirm that the relationship is causal. It just means that those two things go together. Um, and, and oftentimes they can be causal, but I think what we have to recognize is that right now what we have is a lot of information from cross-sectional studies and starting to get more information from what we call longitudinal studies, which can tell us which thing is happening first. You know, is the violence influencing economic status or is economic status influencing risk of violence? So with that caveat, um, let's look at some of the reasons that we think that we see such inconsistencies of the core relationship between various economic factors and IPV across settings. One is that there's evidence to suggest that that relationship is actually influenced a lot by the existing gender norms in the setting. And what I mean by that is in settings where women are uh, normally supposed to remain in the domestic sphere and men, for example, are supposed to be the economic provider. Um, the introduction or the relationship between women's economic empowerment and um, the, the higher list, or excuse me, women's economic empowerment and IPV varies depending on what those background norms are. Also varies, and we'll see it how about how acceptable, what is the, the acceptable the acceptability of violence in a setting. Um, it might also vary by the nature of the opportunity. So is this something where someone's giving cash to women on a short-term emergency basis um, where they necessarily can't integrate it long-term into their planning? Or is it actually a long-term commitment, for example, as part of a social protection program where women and households can actually plan on and, and know that that funding is coming? Um, there's also this issue around women's relative contributions to men. This goes back to some of the notions around roles. And if what we see is sometimes when women contribute more than men in a setting where men are supposed to be providers, this can actually increase women's risk of violence in the short term because it disrupts the, the gendered, uh, gender norms or gender expectations in the household. And depending on how the man responds to that, it can actually, he can actually overcompensate, so to speak, and try to, um, try to uh, actually uh, reestablish power um, and, and by uh, using violence. Um, so the, the finally thing is, is, it, is if you actually look at the models of how we're thinking about this, oftentimes it really comes down to how does the individual husband respond? Does he perceive women's economic empowerment is actually an asset to the family? You know, there's more money coming in, there's less stress on the family, or does he see it a threat, as a threat to his authority? So let's see how that plays out in some data. So what we see in terms of population studies from, let's say, the demographic and health surveys, those are large national level surveys that are done every three to five years. Um, and they just collect a lot of basic information on women's health and well-being in their lives and their economic status. What you see here is that in most African countries, um, employed women on average are at greater risk of IPV than non-employed women, at least in the short term. Um, and that the increase is greatest for women who enter the labor force where it's still uncommon and less accepted. So when they are in the vanguard where they're starting to enter uh, formal labor, but most of their, their, uh, their neighbor 
um, or their community, women are still not working, that's a period of high risk. Over time, what we think may be happening is that as female employment becomes more accepted and working um, becomes more accepted and more and more women enter the labor force, that having a job and working actually shifts to becoming protective. Because what you see is that if you look at country levels and you look at, at levels of formal employment, those countries that have a higher share of women in formal employment have overall lower levels of IPV. So what we think may be happening is that we're actually seeing a shift over time where something that might in a particular setting increase risk as it becomes normative and more and more women enter the labor force that actually women's access to formal labor become shifts from being a risk to being protective. Now you also see this in, for example, case studies. And this is a really interesting study um, uh, done by uh, Sydney Schuler, And she followed the work, of, she followed uh, eight or nine different villages in Bangladesh over from 2002 to 2014. And they basically were looking at women's lives over that extended period of time. And what they saw here is at the beginning, with the emergent economic empowerment of women, um, when men's role of breadwinner was being challenged, and you saw that in the qualitative data, in their quantitative surveys, women's economic empowerment programs like microfinance actually was increasing risk of IPV. But by 2014, in the same villages, after there had been more government programs, that the domestic violence law had been passed, there had been work on women's economic um, um, empowerment, and there had been programs around norms, um, it became far more normative and acceptable for women to work outside of the home. Men's attitudes and norms had changed and they to accommodate this empowerment and they started to see it as a positive benefit. And actually by 2014 in these same settings, women who were working outside had a lower risk of violence. So what this is telling us is that context matters in this in the relationship between economic empowerment and violence. Um, this is a st this is basically just another slide um, where it looks at um, 30 of these different uh, studies in Africa, the demographic and health surveys, um, and compared the relationship between employment and um, women's um, risk of IPV in settings where domestic violence was considered highly normative and acceptable versus settings where it wasn't, or it was less so, I should say. And what you see in this graph is that in those settings where violence is highly accepted, okay, so the blue bars, the levels of abuse that women experienced in the last year, the red bars, is actually higher than on the right-hand side graph where you have less acceptance of violence. So the blue bars are lower, but the rate of abuse is higher. Uh, I mean, excuse me, the rate of abuse is lower as well. So what we're basically, what this is telling us is that your relationship between employment and IPV um, is different in settings depending on the overall acceptability of domestic violence. So just one last thing with respect to employment is, and this actually is a very interesting study that actually uh, complicates things a little bit, our understanding, because rather than being just an association, this is a field experiment. And, and this actually allows us to better assess the relationship between employment and IPV, because we know that that there's no what researchers call selection bias, meaning, you know, when you're just looking at, at relationships at a population level or a community level, it could be that there's something just about the women who choose to seek jobs that makes them different than the women who don't. And maybe that is part of the reason that they're at higher risk. But with, the, with a field experiment where women are randomized, where they're randomly put into two groups, 
we, we can feel much more comfortable that actually we're assessing just the impact of the employment. And so this was a field experiment that was done in Ethiopia. And what they did is, is they worked with factory owners who had um, worked in industrial centers where they had women employed making shoes or, or making garments. And so the factory owners, there's way more women who want these jobs than can actually, and that are eligible than their actual jobs. So the factory owners said, okay, we will allow you to, we'll pre-screen everyone for eligibility. And then you, we will just pick out of a hat. We will randomly uh, determine who gets the job offer and who doesn't. Um, and so when that happened, what they found is that 12 to 18 months later, um, women who were offered the job had a much higher uh, probability of working, which is not surprising. Many of them took up the job. They had much higher earnings. They had a bigger share of the couple's income, so they were bringing more money into the household. But there didn't, in this setting, appear to be an impact on their individual average risk of physical or sexual IPV. So I offer this just to show that this is the kind of research that actually is going to allow us to, to tease this out a little bit better because we can look specifically at the implications of just offering the job. So now moving on, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what the evidence says about programs where we're actually trying to actively intervene. And I'm going to bucket these into three different kinds of programs. One is what I'm calling economic strengthening programs. And these are the savings groups, the microfinance groups, where there's small loans or business development, things where the entire focus of the intervention is economic strengthening. Um, then I'm going to look at economic strengthening plus meaning it's economic strengthening, but there's an added component, um, oftentimes something related to training or group nutrition or something else. There's a plus element, so it's two things together. And the last that I want to look at is um, social protection programs. And these are programs that governments put in place to create sort of a floor for families, poor families. So they actually give transfers over time, um, meaning they give actual cash to families. Um, they know the cash is coming and it, it, it helps ensure that people, if there's something that goes wrong, there's an illness or there's a another type of economic shock to their family that they don't dip into great economic uh, challenges. Um, so now the take home of where we stand in terms of the evidence right now is it is, and again, this is an evolving field. So I offer this as the best that we can say at this moment in time is that the economic strengthening programs alone, when they're just offered, don't appear to be effective at reducing IPV or household um, uh, violence in the household. Now, that's not to say they don't help the household, they do. I mean, so you see lots of benefits to the household, um, but what you don't see is that those economic benefits to the household or to the woman are, are enough um, to actually change her risk of IPV. What we see with the economic strengthening plus is some promising um, uh, results where we're actually seeing some reductions in levels of IPV, a risk of IPV in programs that are combining an economic strengthening with another component. And finally, with the cash transfers alone, we're seeing actually positive reductions in levels of IPV um, at a household and a community level, even though those programs aren't designed specifically to influence um, domestic violence. So let's sort that out just a bit. So this is an example of one of these PLUS programs, and this is one of the oldest examples. Um, where they, they basically took an existing microfinance scheme and they added uh, a 10 to 12 session participatory gender and, and IPV kind of uh, skills-based um, 
reflection group on top of it. So it was a curriculum women participated in um, after as part of their loan groups. And when you compared women who got the loans and the extra plus um, participatory gender training, um, into the future they had their current domestic violence rates of physical IPB reduced 55% over a two year period. It also had, not surprisingly, a lot of positive impacts on, on, on the household in terms of it being less poor, improved communication, um, as well as this was also focused on HIV risk. So they had a higher uptake of HIV and less unprotected sex. Now, that was comparing people that got both to people who got nothing, okay? What another study looked at a similar microcredit scheme and, and, and put on top of it a similar type of participatory gender and uh, transformative curriculum, but they were comparing enrolling women from who received microcredit plus the participatory gender thing compared to women who didn't. And here you did, you also saw a reduction in physical violence. It was reduced 36% over two years. Um, it had no, this particular intervention had no impact on sexual violence, um, but there was a reduced acceptance uh, of, of domestic violence among uh, the participants and their partners. I'm gonna skip this one. Um, so moving on now to cash transfer programs. We recently, um, there's been a number of efforts, including one that we were involved in directly to try to review what is known from programs about their impact on, on risk of IPB. And again, what you have to remember is these are programs that their primary purpose is poverty reduction and to try to you know, create a floor for households so they don't just, um, uh, they don't suffer too much in, in if there's a, a crisis in the household. So it's usually money that's given either to the woman or to the household, sometimes to the man. Um, and what we see is across those programs in the 24 studies that we reviewed, the majority of them showed, or so three-fourths or 73% of them showed a reduction in overall levels of IPV. Only one study suggested increased risk, and it was increased risk of emotional and uh, violence and controlling behavior. And that um, actually, while there was a lot of concern that if there was more money given to households that men might divert some of this money to alcohol, drugs, or gambling, or other kinds of, of things that wouldn't necessarily benefit the household, there was very little evidence of that across these studies. So this just is a, a graph of that um, study by uh, Buhler, um, which was published in the World Bank Observer. And what you see is the blue lines are the study, quantitative studies that show decreases, or, or basically you have the blue is the quantitative studies and the purple is the qualitative studies. Um, and, and I think the point here is just the same point as before is that you know, we're seeing some reductions, we're not seeing a lot of increased risk. Um, and, and so this is something that we should pursue further because many, many millions of people are part of these programs. And if they have a positive impact on reducing women's risk of violence, they could be having uh, an enormous impact on overall levels of violence, uh, even if they're only influencing violence a small amount. And it seems like it's, we're talking about reductions on the order of six to seven percentage points. But if it affects many, many households and many women, this could be an important uh, intervention. So we talk, um, a little bit about uh, the pathways. One of the things we did in this study was to try to understand if, in, you know, if indeed uh, cash given to households is somehow influencing levels of domestic violence, how is it doing that? And we identified three primary um, 
pathways. One is called is operating at the household level. So this is one where actually the cash is increasing economic security and emotional well-being um, of the household, improving perhaps mental health, um, and therefore by virtue of reducing stress, um, being able to reduce violence. The second is what we're calling sort of household conflict. And this is actually affecting conflict at the level of the couple. And here, what we think is going on from the qualitative data is that when you are a household that's living right at the edge and every day, women, for example, need to negotiate with their partner about the money for that morning to go off to get the food for the day or to, to buy things needed for the household, that that interaction can be quite stressful, especially if the man doesn't have a job or if he's used the money for something else. Uh, and, and so it, it appears that maybe what's happening is just eliminating, if women have enough cash to be able to do the, the roles that they need to take care of in the household, that they don't have to constantly come into conflict in order to negotiate access to money, that that might be one of the mechanisms through which this is working. And the final is what we're calling the women's empowerment pathway. And I'm just gonna go into that just a little bit more. And this is one where, if you recall some of what I was saying at the beginning of the talk, is there is this idea that if women have access to cash, that gives them more power, um, more self-confidence, and, and actually a better, better able to negotiate in the relationship for what they want. That shift in power dynamic in the relationship, though, can either increase or decrease her risk of violence, depending on how the partner reacts. So if he's accepting and he says, oh, great, you know, this is wonderful. She's bringing in more cash. It's actually helping us. Um, you know, this is a benefit. And he supports her. Um, we see instances where levels of her risk of violence going down. But if he is threatened by that, if he feels that she's usurping his role as provider and male breadwinner, then he may overcompensate and try to reassert, reassert authority in the household. Um, so again, it can go either direction. So just finally, a few other things as we try to sort out um, how this is working is there's research now going on to look at, well, does the modality of the transfer matter? Does it matter if we give cash or a voucher or food? Um, does it matter if the woman gets it or the man gets it? All of these design dimensions of how we design cash transfer programs are really important for us to sort out because what it could do is we, by tweaking them, we might be able to improve the impact of these social protection and cash programs on, on women's levels of violence. I'm gonna skip ahead um, because I want to give us enough time to talk through this. So um, we will make sure that the bits that I skip that you have access to. Um, so my takeaways from what we know in the evidence right now is that the relationship between women's economic empowerment and IPV is both complex and nuanced. Um, a key factor in the variability is how the partner responds and how men in a setting or men in a particular relationship respond to the changes in the power dynamics in the relationship and women's new roles or women's new engagement and power, um, economic power. Um, it also is influenced by context so, you know, is this an area where women working is highly accepted? Is this an area where very few women are worked and women are in purda and are not supposed to go outside of the home? These things are going to influence that relationship. We do think, although this is still a hypothesis, that as women's economic empowerment becomes more normalized, um, that we'll actually see uh, any increased risk disappear and that actually 
women's economic engagement will start to become a highly protective factor. And it is a highly protective factor in more high income and in settings where women's working and women's having economic power is more normalized. Um, and, and additionally though, and this is important, is that we don't find much support, in fact, very little support at this point for the idea that economic strengthening alone without other components of gender transformative work or work on social norms or working with men, for example, reduces violence in the short term. So this simple idea that if we empower women economically, violence will go down, there is very little support for that. Over the long term, that's another story. I think as we empower women as a cl class and more and more women enter and have economic power, I think we're gonna see levels of violence go down um, you know, at a population level. So finally, in terms of thinking about what this means for programming and for those who are working on women's economic empowerment is, I think what we've learned so far is that savings and loan groups and women's groups like women's microfinance groups are a useful platform for delivering combined programming. So like gender training on top of women's economic strengthening, um, partly because people are motivated by the access to cash and the immediate need that, that those kinds of programs um, um, serve. And so by combining them, you not only get the potential synergies on violence, but you also get people's participation rates in and in, in continuation of participating in, let's say, these gender programs or the nutrition programs or whatever your plus element is, um, well, um, they're higher. Um, I think that we have to invest more time um, in understanding the normative context in which we're launching programs. Um, not, so, not because we shouldn't launch them, but because we need to adapt them and their design so that we are empowering ec women economically, um, but we're not also potentially exacerbating risk of violence in the short term. Um, I think it's also very important to consider how the programs are framed. So money is not always just money. Money that was given, for example, for women to uh, take care of children or for children's nutrition or things that are within their existing gender roles might be interpreted or received very differently um, by men, for example, or by the women themselves than something that is explicitly framed in terms of women's economic empowerment. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't do women's economic empowerment. I think we should. But I do think we have to think about um, what are the messages that people are getting accompanying these programs. So can we frame them as improving things for the household, making, the, making everyone better off in addition to empowering women? Um, and finally, just in some final ideas is I think that we need to spend more time making sure that men and family members understand the program and how it could benefit the family, because men do have a vested interest in the larger family. Um, I think we need to spend more time in making sure that our plus programming is really well implemented. Um, so that if it's if we're using facilitators and we're doing curriculum that we've actually well designed those programs and that we've trained the facilitators um, very well because we see that the quality of implementation influences their impact in the real world. Um, and I think we need to better understand and continue the work that researchers and others are doing to try to understand these relationships so that the next time we do a talk like this, our messages to those people who are uh, leading the programs on women's economic empowerment can be clearer. So I think I'll stop there and turn it back over to Rita. Um, and perhaps we can start with some questions. I think we have about 20 minutes. Thank you so much, Laurie, for the great presentation. I can see from the chat box people are really 
finding this helpful. So I won't dwell in, on any summarizing because it looked really clear. I'd rather go ahead and um, take a few questions of clarification, if you can hear me. Sure. Because, uh, yeah, great. So um, there's uh, a clarification question. They want to know um, if one can get it, if she got it right, that economic strengthening alone increases IPV? I'll give a set of thoughts. Okay. So, or, or you prefer to go one by one? Okay, cool. Go okay. ahead, Laurie. Yeah, let's do one by one. Um, so in terms of, of what, I wouldn't say that necessarily economic strengthening alone Sorry, a truck was going by. <laughs> I wouldn't say that economic strengthening alone necessarily increases violence. What the findings are right now is that economic strengthening alone doesn't of itself reduce violence of IPV. So that where we've seen reductions um, in IPV in programs like microfinance or business training or savings groups is when it's been accompanied by other programming. So it's sort of a combined intervention. Thanks, Laurie. I hope it's clear. Another question of clarification. Um, can you clarify what economic empowerment plus is? Right. Economic. So what I, yeah, so what I mean by that is, is combining two kinds of interventions together, right? So you have your economic empowerment, but you might also be doing something like uh, having the women uh, have a nutrition education program where they're learning how to, to improve their food security and they're working together as a group. Um, you might actually, if you're worried specifically about violence, the ones that people have been designing, as I said, are curricula where the women who are in, let's say, a microfinance group or a savings and loan group, what they do is they come and then they're invited to participate in another set of group um, sessions that are actually um, creating opportunities to talk about violence, to talk about uh, gender roles in the family, to give women skills around um, how to be uh, communicate and be more assertive. Um, sometimes the plus, the added program, is actually not just with women, but with couples, for example, where you bring couples together and you're working with couples. So it just means it's, it's an add-on um, in the sense that, or it's a combined program, so that you're not just doing economic strengthening, but you're doing other type of goals at the same time. And there seems to be some synergy that happens between the two. And that's one of the things that we need to sort out more. Thanks so much, Laurie. I, I wondered if we could give an opportunity for some people who've got their hands up from the beginning for one or two questions, and then you can go back to the question. So um, Bridget? I saw your hand up from the beginning. Could you unmute yourself and just voice your question, please? Um, okay, thanks very much. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, I would like to find out whether there, there have been any successful projects on women's economic empowerment that has uh, engaged men from the beginning. And as a result of that, the IPV has been reduced. Great question, uh, great question, Bridget. So I do think that that's a, a very productive way to go. And, and so there are programs where um, there's been a very conscious effort to engage men or at, least at different levels. So everything from just making sure that the men actually understand the program, that they have an opportunity to talk about it, that they 
are, are discuss, discussed um, with them about the benefits that can come from their, their wives participating, all the way up through programs that actually have groups that are working with men or groups that are working with couples or media campaigns, for example, that are emphasizing the importance uh, and how women, you know, women having more access to funding um, helps uh, improve you know, uh, healthy families and healthy children or you know, the, there's a lot of different things that people are doing, but I think that the key idea here is, is to try to um, try to ensure that as to the best of our ability when we're doing this, that we, we, we enlist men as allies in it and we help, um, we help un understand or help them understand that, you know, the world has changed right? It's very hard in this macroeconomic environment for anybody to have just one person bringing income into the home. That, you know, what's happening all over the world is that women and men are having to start to both work in order to support families and, and to sort of normalize that um, and in order to try to make people feel more comfortable with it and, and, and to try to support those women who are choosing to be the first in their settings to engage in these programs. Thanks, Laurie. Why don't we take uh, next Immaculate? You had your hand up. If it, your question hasn't been addressed in one of the responses, please go ahead and voice it. Immaculate. Sounds like she's got a big background noise. So um, why don't we give a chance to Elise? Elise Young, could you unmute yourself and voice your question, please? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, sure, yes. Great. Um, thank you so much, Laurie, a, a great presentation. Um, I'm Elise Young with FHI 360, and I'm wondering if in any, any of the research you've done, have you seen any recent studies, let's say in the last, last five to even 10 years, that goes in a little bit deeper on different demographic groups of women, women with disabilities, women who identify as indigenous or minority ethnic groups. I think that this is incredibly helpful to this overall field. And, you know, as we dig into deeper understanding rural versus, versus urban, I'm just curious if you know of any good studies out there that's taking that level of, of nuanced, deeper dive. Yeah, I thank you for that question. I mean, I, I think that everyone recognizes that, you know, we need to start not treating women as a unified group. Um, and in fact, most of the programs that exist are working with very specific uh, types of women. So most of the, the programs, for example, that are recruiting women into village savings and loan or recruiting into microfinance or even the cash transfers, they are directed selectively at very poor households and women who are, are, are perhaps under more, are definitely under more challenging circumstances than others. So there is a these findings apply mostly to women who are already in families living on the edge. Now, the, what you're saying is even amongst that, there are, are women who have additional challenges dis, uh, in terms of ethnic identity or disability. And, and to be honest, I don't think the research is there yet. Um, I think that there, is it's acknowledged and people recognize that it needs to be done, but I think it's pretty much the next frontier. And I think that, for example, in the next phase of a uh, program that DFID or the UK government is funding um, in order to create innovations and to study new sort of uh, the next generation of programming and also research, they have specifically identified um, doing more research with these with these um, specific kinds of populations, those that are hard to reach and that have special challenges. So I would, you know, 
I would expect to see over the next five years that research emerging, but I don't think we have much of it now. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, we're shifting to questions from the chat box. Those who had their hands up, please keep the hands up. We'll come back to you. Um, the, I'm going to read one by one, Laurie, or two set of questions just for you. Okay. okay. So one question says, are there any, yeah, are there any studies, can you hear me, Laurie? Uh, you're kind of going in and out, Rita. Can you hear me? Um, tr try again. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, it's heavily raining in Kigali, so if you can't, yeah, there's a question. Are there any studies, current best practices or methodologies to help IPV victims engage in women economic empowerment interventions? And the clarification they're seeking, sequencing on therapy, additional help, setting up a business or something like that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't actually catch that. And I can, I can, uh, yeah. this is Julian, I can uh, ask the question. So the question is, are there any studies or current best practices on methodologies to help uh, intimate partner violence victims engage in women's economic empowerment interventions? And some of the examples that they put here were sequencing of therapy, additional help, setting up a business. Right. So I do think that there are, um, I mean, I'm not sure how much these interventions have been studied thus far, but I do know that there are many groups who are working with survivors or people who are experiencing domestic violence um, who are then trying to introduce job training and, and, and support um, to help them get on their feet, especially those women who may have chosen to leave a relationship. Um, and, and therefore are needing to try to support themselves and their family. Um, I, I know that programming is going on. Um, whether or not there's a, a, a much research on that type of programming, I, I don't know, but we could, uh, if you contact me separately, um, we could take a look for you and see what we can find. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks so much, Laurie. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So another question was, you said the intervention should be long term to create possible changes in IPV. So you have any, do you have any review on how long an intervention should be so they will be able to see significant changes or effects? So what I was specifically uh, trying to say, or when I was talking about this, I mean, I do think in general when we're doing IPV programming in terms of prevention or trying to reduce uh, risk of IPV, that, you know, the longer the program can go on, the more chance that there is uh, going to be sustained change. However, what I was talking about is if we are giving, let's say, cash to households. There's two ways that this is tending to happen right now. One is people in the humanitarian settings, for example, if you are using cash um, to give to families to deal with the immediate crisis. So there's been a hurricane or there's been a, um, a conflict and, and people have had to flee. Um, and so those who are working with refugees or internally displaced people um, oftentimes will use cash as an immediate intervention to try to help families sustain themselves um, during the crisis. The question is, is does cash under those circumstances have the same impact on IPV as we're seeing in these long-term programs where it's more like households are enrolled, households that have, let's say, children under five, every month are getting a, um, a, a stipend from the government, for example. And, and we don't really have a good answer to that question yet, but you could imagine that if you have a benefit that you know is only gonna be there for six months, 
it may not have the same impact on the dynamics in the household and the long-term change as you might see if it's something that you know your family's going to get for the entire time that you have children who are young for example so that was what i was the point i was trying to make about length is that we need to be thinking about how certain um, are these these outcomes and that different kinds of economic interventions are going to potentially play out differently in terms of their impact on the family so things that you that are short that are, are versus those that are predictable and long-term might actually influence uh, household dynamics and, and risk of IPV very differently. Thanks, Laurie, really helpful. Going back to hands up, Jacqueline, if you can hear me, can you unmute yourself and voice your question, please? Hi, Laurie, um, thank Hi. you for the great presentation. Um, so, uh, this is a good segue because I'm interested in two facets. One is the humanitarian context where norms are, norms and community is severely disrupted, mm -hmm. as are mm -hmm. our notions of, you know, what a household is, what, a, what an economic unit is. Um, and at Women's Refugee Commission, we are doing a lot of work on looking at cash and GBV, so I'll follow up with you after this as well. The other question is, if um, if I understood correctly, the economic alone intervention, we're not seeing evidence for a reduction in IPV. The, the cash, I'm, I know I'm over probably simplifying yeah. this, but as your summary states, um, but that the cash intervention does in fact have um, evidence for a reduction. So yeah. I'm... I, I mean, I <laughs> understand the gender transformative piece being um, critical, but I find that really um, to be powerful. And I can see that it, it might be that this, that perhaps it's the difference between a short-term intervention and a long-term one, but I'm curious in terms of how you're thinking about that and how would we effectively approach understanding that? Right. I, I was wondering if someone was going to pick up on that because I think it's a, it's a really, really important question is like, well, why would we be seeing something with these kind of social protection cash benefits program, but not see it in some of the uh, entrepreneurship, microfinance or savings schemes? And I don't have a good answer, but what I could imagine and I think we need to look at is, is once we start to actually study mechanisms more, I think it's going to help because let's say, for example, that women, you know, women may get training, they may have access to a loan, but to actually translate that into a successful business that's bringing in cash that's sustainable is a much has much more or many more steps where something could go wrong right or something may not be adequate to to be able to actually there may not be a market or there may be you know something else happens whereas cash is direct it's like you have the cash and you can spend it as you want and and it is more immediate so there's less opportunity i mean there's less upfront that needs to happen um, in terms of it being able to make an immediate impact on household dynamics. And especially if part of the way that that cash is working is through this issue around conflict and just the, the angst, the stress, the, the, the triggering that happens around the fact that households are now living in situations where they can't survive, they don't have funding, the old ways of working are not sufficient, and that's putting stress on, on the old sort of what I used to, call, what's been called the patriarchal bargain, that women do certain things and men provide and it all works out. But if, if you get to a point where you can't sustain your household uh, with those old rules, um, what cash is doing is just so solving it short term, 
by eliminating some of those stresses and those arguments. That, that would be my best guess at this point, but I think it's a really interesting ch challenge for us as a, a field to try to sort out. Thank you. Thanks both. And Mukang, Mukweda, sorry if I mispronounce your name. Can you voice your question, please? Yeah, thank you, Laurie, for a good presentation. I'm Anna Margaret Mukwenda from the National Council of People Living with HIV in Tanzania. Uh, my question is basically three -plunge. Uh What triggers IPV that we think women economic empowerment will, uh, will take care of? And have we gone uh, in too deep seeing how male our uh, men are being involved uh, into reducing uh, IPV and maybe what are the indicators that shows main contribution towards reduced IPV. Over. Thank you. So I, I, I hope I'm answering, I understood your question right, but one thing I can say is I mean, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of information out there. And I think what we could do is, is have some future um, webinars where we unpack some of this in, in more detail. Because when, when we say that economic empowerment on average alone does not seem to be reducing women's H, uh, IPB levels, that means that's basically looking at an average, meaning we're looking across all of the women that we're studying, right? It could be that it's helping some women, right? And in, in, in the sense that their, their, their rates of violence are going down because their partners are being supportive and, it, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and they're being successful um, and they're translating that the, that credit or that savings and things into benefits. Um, at the same time that some other woman experience may be going in the opposite direction. But when you add those two things together, you show no overall effect. And so I think what we need to do is start to understand in a much deeper way than we do now, what ha is happening to women individually in these in our programs and then how do we understand what's happening at a community level um, and then what can we do to support women um, so that our programs have the best chance of benefiting them both in the short term and the long term because the one thing i want to say is the, the takeaway from this talk should not be that we should not be doing ec women's economic strengthening because it may put them at risk. All social change happens on the backs of brave individuals. And what we need to do is help limit harm if it exists, but we need, women need to be economically empowered. Households need to be economically empowered. We need to find ways to work um, and, 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 and reduce, you know, engage men and, and others so that our programs can actually truly realize a transformation in women's lives. Because this, may, this, this is a short-term risk, right? This is as things are changing as norms are changing, as women are changing, as families are changing, as men's ideas about women's roles are changing, um, this, is a, this is where the, the period of, 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 of potential higher risks exist. But over the long term, it's very clear that in countries and in settings where women are more economically empowered and have jobs and have more control over resources, their risk of violence is down. So it's how do we get from where we are now to where we need to be um, in, in a way that is most responsible and, and to women and, and to their needs 
Thank you so much, Laurie. I'm just cautious of time with five minutes uh, for now. So I'll take one more question before we close. Um, are there, are there uh, can you please provide advice on working on women economic empowerment and IPV in the context of COVID-19, particularly where there have been calls for governments to address poverty through stimulus packages? Right. That's trying to be in the context, yeah. So I think this is a hugely important topic. And in fact, we've had a sort of support group of groups who um, we have a, a coffee where people who want to talk through this issue, um, a virtual coffee, uh, can sign up. And if you're interested in participating, you can send us a, a, a note. But I think one of the things that women's groups can do is, I mean, I can't say anything generic um, I think it really depends on your setting. But I would suggest that women, women's organizations and those concerned with women's uh, well-being during COVID actually think about how they can interact with those parts of their government and that are providing these, these uh, cash transfer programs um, to ensure that they you know, to ensure that there's linkages at the very least so that women know that, that there's services that they can go to, um, that we try to work together to make sure that under this period of time when we know the risk of violence is going up for women in households, that this is part of the discussion of policymakers, um, that we make, for example, the support services and the counseling um, as to be essential services so that they have to continue and be supported during the time of COVID. So, I mean, I think that's a longer answer than, I mean, a longer conversation. And um, I invite anyone who's interested in that uh, uh, to join us in, in some additional conversations about that with the collaborative. Thanks so much, Laurie. Um, and we almost at the top of the hour and I would like to thank you so much, Laurie, and thank everyone for joining us. Uh, like we said, the recording will be available within a couple of weeks and we'll share that with you. It will be also on our website. And like Laurie said, we continue the conversation through the virtual coffee where we focus more on our prevention programming during this time of COVID. So feel really ready to join. And my colleague, Juliana, is pasting some of the links where you can stay connected with us and uh, all the other previous webinars where you can make a kind of follow up on what we've been talking about are available on our website. So um, if there is nothing else you want to add, Laurie, I'll just thank our audience for the great participation and engagement and say goodbye and thanks Thank you.